Thank you for viewing this series called Altar Call, which is about Christ's work in his sanctuary, teaching us how he saves us. This is the third presentation called The Cost of Mercy. Once a year, on the tenth day of the seventh month, God directed his people to have their sanctuary, which was his place of residence, purified. Leviticus 16 verse 16 tells us what happens on that day. This was through a ritual performed by the high priest. Thus he shall make atonement for the holy place in this particular chapter. That means the most holy place. From the impurities of the people of Israel and from their rebellious sins as well as all their sins, meaning their other sins. And so he shall do for the tent of meeting, meaning the rest of the sanctuary, which remains with them in the midst of their impurities. What's going on? How was the sanctuary cleansed on the Day of Atonement? And what does this mean for us in terms of what God is trying to teach us about how he saves us? I'm going to present here the Day of Atonement made simple. It was a very complex service, but we're going to boil it down. There were five main animal sacrifices that were performed in Leviticus 16 during the unique part of the ritual service of this day. First of all, there was a purification offering, a so-called sin offering, that was offered to the Lord. This was a bull, and it was offered on behalf of the priests. Second, there was a purification offering, goat, for the lay people. Then there was a purification ritual, which was not a purification offering in the sense of a sacrifice. It was just a ritual of a goat. And this was from everyone, from the priests and from the people. The people provided it, but it was for the priests as well. And this was to be given to Azazel, not to the Lord. Azazel, whoever that is. We have to find out, don't we? Then there was a burnt offering ram for the priests and a burnt offering ram for the lay people. So you can see that there are these two pairs of sacrifices. Purification offering for the priests and the people. Burnt offering for the priests and the people. But there was also in the middle this purification ritual of a live goat for Azazel. Now to boil this down and make it simple, only the purification offering goat for the lay people had independent significance pointing forward to Christ's sacrifice. The bull and the ram for the priests were necessary because the priests were faulty. In the book of Hebrews it says that because Christ is sinless, he as our high priest needs no sacrifice for himself. So none of the Israelite sacrifices, whether in Leviticus 4 or in Leviticus 16, the sacrifices that the priests offered on behalf of themselves, none of those pointed forward to sacrifices that Christ has to actually offer on behalf of himself. Do you see what I'm saying? So there's no end time reality to which these sacrifices point. Now the bull and the ram for the priests were necessary because the priests were faulty. The burnt offering ram for the lay people added to the quantity of their purification offering. When you had a purification offering performed in a pair with a burnt offering, then the burnt offering adds to the quantity of the purification offering. It's as though there's a larger purification offering. For example, in Leviticus 5, a person who sins has to bring a sheep or a goat for a sin offering, purification offering. But if they can't afford this flock animal, then they can bring two birds, and those two birds are offered, one for a purification offering, the other one for a burnt offering. The two of them together make up the functional equivalent of one purification offering. You see what I'm saying? So the burnt offering would add to the quantity, but it had no separate independent significance. So you see, we've taken these four animal sacrifices, two purification offerings, two burnt offerings. And the ones for the priests don't point to a future reality. And the burnt offering for the lay people just combines in its meaning 
with the goat for the lay people. So that makes the Day of Atonement much more simple. Cleansing the sanctuary and the camp really all boils down to the meaning of, I call it, a tale of two goats. A tale of two goats. There was the Lord's goat for the lay people, which carried the meaning of Christ's role for his people, bearing their sins. And then there was the non-sacrificial live goat for Azazel, representing somebody else. We have to find out who that is. That's the Day of Atonement made simple. Now here are the two goats. There they are, you see? Now can you tell one goat from the other? Which one can you tell by looking at it? Which one is supposed to be the Lord's goat? Which one is to be Azazel's goat? You can't tell by looking at them. And that's part of the point. The role of each one is determined by a sacred lot, by casting lots according to Leviticus 16. By those lots, as we see by comparing with other places in the Bible where lots are used, that's the way of the Lord choosing the role. So people can't tell the difference between the Lord and whoever this Azazel is. We need the Lord's guidance to be able to do that. So once the roles of these goats were determined, the lot was placed upon um, its head of each one, telling what its role was, and then the sacrifices were done. But who is this mysterious Azazel to whom this second goat, this live goat, was to be taken? Not offered as a sacrifice, not an offering, but to go to it as a ritual garbage truck. This Azazel is a kind of personal being who could own a goat. Because in Leviticus 16 verse 8, the goat is four or two, meaning belonging to Azazel. This is the same kind of expression used in Hebrew, the preposition lamed, belonging to, that is found in ancient Near Eastern seals. When I was in Jerusalem studying ancient inscriptions, we would read these seals and it said l, belonging to, and then the proper name. So this Azazel is a proper name referring to a person or a personality. He could be supernatural, but he's at least a personality. He can own a goat. This goat belonging to Azazel was a purification ritual, but was never given to God as an offering, and it's not offered to Azazel as a sacrifice. It was only sent away from God, carrying this moral waste, these sins of the Israelites, into the wilderness to Azazel, according to Leviticus 16, verse 10, and then verses 20, uh, 21 and 22. Now just think about that for a moment. Here is an animal, and there's, there's this toxic waste. How would you feel if somebody loaded a dump truck full of all kinds of toxic chemical or nuclear waste, and then they sent that and they dumped it in your backyard? Would you feel very kindly toward them? Would that be a friendly gesture? No, that person would have to be your enemy, wouldn't it? Because that's like putting a dirty bomb in your yard. Now, I have, to, I have a confession to make. I'm, I'm always embarrassed when I tell this story. But it makes a good point, so I tell it even though I'm rather sheepish about it. Okay. Years ago, when I lived in a different state a long way from here, um, I was doing yard work to put myself through, through school, working with my wife, and we heard that the, uh, there, was a, there was a chicken poultry farm that was going out of business. And they had a lot of chicken manure. No more chickens, but a lot of chicken manure. Well, that was great for us because we were gardeners. We were wanting to put in a vegetable garden at a lady's place. And so we loaded up a trailer, pulled it with her car, and I had this trailer that I, I owned, it was a big one, uh, that we went and loaded up all of this chicken manure. And this was good stuff. I mean, it was, it was green, some of it was, it had maggots in it, it was great stuff. It would do good things for the soil. But it had so much ammonia in it that it burned my wife's lungs just loading it up. And, Took her a couple of weeks to recover. This was powerful stuff. And as I was driving up the road toward this lady's house, I passed a road going off in another direction toward somebody's house. And I knew exactly where they lived, just a few doors down. And this is somebody that had really done my family dirty. Now, you can think of what may have gone on in my mind. And I was tempted. Now, I just sort of chuckled about it. I didn't really cherish this temptation, but I, you know, I, I've, I've repented of uh, even this thought. But you know what the thought was? 
take this whole rink, reeking, maggot-infested, stinking load and dump it on his front lawn. That's what I was thinking would be kind of a funny thing to do. Now, would that have been a friendly gesture? Now you get the point. This Azazel must be the Lord's enemy. It cannot be a friend. It must be another person, and it's the enemy. Atonement or purgation is made on the live goat itself in the sense that it carries the Israelite sins away from their camp back to the source of evil, Azazel. This live goat is like a ritual garbage truck. The people are atoned for by the goat atoning in this way in the basic sense that the evil is removed from their midst. They're not atoned for in the substitutionary sense that that goat is bearing the sins for them. It's not a sacrifice. It's not a substitute. It's just bearing away that which is removing evil from their midst. It's like in Numbers 25, 13, where the Lord said to Phineas, the Lord said to, to Phineas that I give you an eternal covenant of priesthood. And that's because Phineas destroyed evildoers from the midst of the camp of Israel. That was not substitutionary atonement. That was just getting rid of evil. And that's the sense in which this Azazel's goat um, makes atonement. The goat belonged to the Lord and was offered to him. It also represented Christ, the Lord, who died for our sins. So it makes sense that the goat belonged to Azazel and was sent to him and would also represent Azazel. Who could that possibly be? Only one person in the universe fits this profile in the Bible. Satan, our great adversary, fits the profile of Azazel as God's enemy. He bears his own sins because he not only originated sin, he instigated Christ's death, he tempts us into sin, and then he falsely accuses us. And in the Bible, in Deuteronomy 19, a false accuser bears the punishment that the accused would have received if they had been shown to be guilty. So for all those reasons, Satan has a one-way ticket to hell, but Satan doesn't bear a molecule of my responsibility. He only bears his own responsibility for all of these different kinds of sin. Only Christ is my substitute and bears any of my sins. Now let's look at the stages of atonement. This day of atonement on the 10th day of the seventh month, came after months and months of the Israelites coming and bringing their sins to the sanctuary, bringing their problems to God, leaving them there. And in fact, in Leviticus chapter 6, it says that when the blood of a purification offering sprinkles on a garment, it has to be washed off. Or when its flesh is boiled in a vessel, the vessel has to be broken if it's a pottery vessel or scoured if it's a, another kind of vessel. So we see that there was a kind of defilement that was carried by these sacrifices. It's true that impurity was to be kept separate from holiness, but in this one instance, God paradoxically allowed the sacrifices to be defiled by the impurities and the sins of the people, the faultiness that they brought to the sanctuary. Paradoxically, this most holy offering carried defilement which could then get on what it touched because God wanted to show that he makes himself vulnerable by saving us. He reaches us and touches us and that affects him in his sanctuary. So the purification offering has a special message to teach us. It's the only kind of sacrifice where that dynamic was in operation, that the blood and the flesh would be in, impure in a certain kind of a sense. So that means when the blood was put on the horns of the altar, then that would make the, the altar carry that defilement that came from the offer. That means that cumulatively, gradually, throughout the year, as the Israelites brought their sacrifices, the, uh, the defilement would build up in the sanctuary. What does that defilement mean? It doesn't disqualify the sanctuary. It doesn't mean there was anything wrong with the blood. That's what blood is supposed to do. Look at your body. Well, you can't look inside, but you know that the blood not only carries nutrients through the arteries as well as oxygen, but through the veins it carries away waste. Nothing wrong with the blood. That's what blood is supposed to do. We sing hymns about Christ's blood washing away our sins. And that's what happened. Sins were being washed away. But washed to where? 
They were washed away at the sanctuary, and that's where, where they were left. But they weren't left there forever, because what goes in must come out, just like what goes up must come down. Evils came into the Israelite sanctuary throughout the year, and then they were taken out of it on the Day of Atonement. There is more evidence for that. Let's look at the evidence, and then look at what it means. Here's the overall dynamic. Throughout the year, the sins come into the sanctuary. This arrow is, is showing the direction toward where God is enthroned above the cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. On the Day of Atonement, however, the sins and impurities go out of the sanctuary, the opposite direction. What goes in must come out. Purging the sanctuary on the Day of Atonement removed all evils that had already been removed from persons by sacrifices throughout the year. So where were these evils in the meantime? Well, they were at the sanctuary. That's where they had been left. There are two pieces of evidence that indicate the reversal that what goes in must come out. The, the first is a reversal of blood applications in the holy place. The second is a difference in the purification of assistance. Let's take, first of all, the reversal of blood applications. In Leviticus chapter 4, verses 3 to 21, there are two sections dealing with the purification offering for the high priest if he sins, or for the whole community when the community sins. In these very special purification offerings of community-wide significance, because after all, the high priest, even if it's just himself, represents the community, these special sin offerings, purification offerings, call for the priest to go inside the sanctuary and to apply blood, sprinkling it seven times in the main part of the, of the holy place, and then to place the blood on the horns of the altar. I used to think that when the priest sprinkled blood seven times, it was between the incense altar and the veil. But in studying the Hebrew expression and looking at the context of what's going on, I realized that the sevenfold sprinkling takes place, as you see, to in, in front of the incense altar. That, that, that is away from the ark. That's the first thing that happens, according to Leviticus 4, verses 6 and 17. So first of all, you have the, the sprinkling in the main part of the area, and then you have the applying the blood on the incense altar. Notice the direction. It's moving towards, towards the ark. However, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest starts sprinkling from the inside out on the ark cover. He goes all the way in. He has to have incense to protect himself, to shield himself with smoke from the glory of God. And this picture shows some smoke, but there would be a lot more. There was a smoke-producing substance in there that would shield him from the glory of God. He was starting from the inside out. Why? Because this was a house-cleaning job. If you're going to sweep out a room, where do you start? You start from the inside and you go out. That's exactly what he did. started from the Ark of the Covenant and then seven times in front of the ark, and then he goes to the outer apartment. Now here the text in Leviticus 16, 16, the second part of the verse, just simply says, he shall do for the tent of meeting what he does, just as he does it in the um, most holy place. What does he do in the most holy place? Applies blood once on an object, seven times in front of that object, so it must be that he applies the blood once on the incense altar, as it says in Exodus 30, verse 10, that he would do, and then seven times in front of that object. See the pattern? Everything moving outward, and then he applies the blood on the altar of burnt offering. He puts it on the horns once, and then he uh, applies the blood seven times on the altar itself. Not in front of it, not in the court, because the court was never consecrated, but in, on the altar itself, because this is the vulnerable, exposed, most holy piece of furniture that's in the court, where God's people bring their sins, and that receives the greatest interaction with all of that faultiness. Now, you, you notice, if I back up this slide and I go back to the previous one, notice where the sevenfold sprinkling is there in the um, most holy place throughout the year. I put it in the same location in front of the incense altar as on the Day of Atonement, where it has to be 
in front of the incense altar. And in this way, the sins and impurities are moving out. So there is a reversal of direction in terms of the blood applications. During the year, they're moving in because that's where sins are going and impurities. And on the Day of Atonement, the sins and impurities come out. What goes in must come out. Two stages of atonement. Another piece of evidence. Disposing of the purification offering carcasses on the Day of Atonement makes the assistant impure, according to Leviticus 16, verse 28, so that he has to wash with water before he can then return into the camp. However, on other days, such a task does not defile the assistants. Leviticus 4, 11 to 12 and 21 says nothing about the assistant needing that purification. Now, some have thought that, um, in fact, in Leviticus 4, you're supposed to assume that. But Leviticus 4 is where the, the most detailed instructions are about including uh, where the ashes have to be dumped and all this kind of stuff. So it's not a place where you have abbreviation taking place. Therefore, we must realize that they simply have, don't have to do this purification offering. If that's true, that correlates with the reversal. Because of the opposite function, sacrifices are carrying evils in to the sanctuary in Leviticus 4, rather than acting as ritual sponges, which then defile those who contact them in Leviticus 16. You see the point? So that's why there's a difference in terms of whether this purification of assistance is needed. Not needed in Leviticus 4 because it has a different function. Now, what about forgiving guilty people? In our previous presentation, we talked about forgiveness and how God wants to forgive. And he's revealed himself, which shows his willingness to forgive. But let's talk a little bit more about the dynamics of forgiveness. Forgiveness is a really difficult thing. If you've ever had to forgive somebody from something where they really, really hurt you, damaged you, wounded you, betrayed you, you know how difficult it is, it is to forgive. And, and this kind of uh, breach of relationship brings about a change in the dynamics between individuals so that some things have to be done in order to uh, restore this. God's headquarters are at his heavenly sanctuary. That's where his throne is according to the Bible. God's throne or sanctuary represents his character, authority, and reputation. We see that in the book of Deuteronomy, God's name is at his sanctuary, and God's name involves his reputation, according to Ezekiel 20. Even today, the name is a reputation. I remember a, a commercial by a retail electronics outlet in California, and it went, we're the good guys. We gotta be good. See, in other words, you've got to live up to your name. And even today, a name is a reputation. God's name was at the sanctuary, and that place represented his reputation. Evils were cleansed out of the earthly sanctuary on the Day of Atonement, clearing his reputation. Physical ritual impurities, rebellious sins, forgivable sins. But why would forgivable sins be handled twice at the sanctuary? After forgiveness, what need for atonement could possibly remain? Because when you think about it, the Bible says, when you're forgiven by God, your sins are, are as far as the east is from the west. In fact, they're, they're in the depths of the sea. And I love what Corey Ten Boom said. She said, no fishing allowed. You don't dig them up. So when you're forgiven, you're forgiven. But isn't that all there is to atonement? Relational reconciliation? See, this word atonement comes from the English uh, at one meant. That's where the word comes from. At one meant. That means reintegration of relationship, reconciliation. Isn't forgiveness the end of it? Why do you need more to the process of reconciliation beyond forgiveness? Well, let's have a look. There is a Bible story that teaches us what there is beyond forgiveness. In 2 Samuel 14, this is a situation where David was sitting upon his throne to judge his people because the king was the judge. He was like the Supreme Court justice. No separation of powers like you have in America today. So he's sitting upon his throne there judging the people, and a woman comes, an elderly woman, and she's dressed in clothes like she's been mourning for a long time. And she comes in and throws herself down in front of David, begs for mercy. She says, help, O king. 
And David says, what's the matter with you? What, what do you want? And she says, I am a widow. My husband is dead. And I had two sons, and one of my sons was killed by the other one. They got in a fight out in the field, and one killed the other. And now all my relatives want to put to death that son who murdered his brother. And if that happens, I'll have nobody. There'll be no one to carry on the line of descendants. My husband's name will be blotted out. And she didn't say it, but there's no social security. So who is going to take care of her in her old age? It was a terrible, miserable situation. And David was caught with a conflict between mercy and justice. He was a merciful man. He wanted, he had pity on her. He wanted to give her um, mercy and forgive her son who murdered his brother. But there was a problem with that. Numbers 35. You can't give ransom for the life of a murderer. The murderer must die. Because otherwise, the price of life is, com is compromised. The value for a life. And so therefore, David was caught in this catch-22. What's he going to do? If he gives mercy to this murderer, then the Jerusalem Post is going to have big headlines that say, David is soft on crime. He's compromised justice. So he says in verse 8 of 2 Samuel 24, he says to this woman, Go to your house, and I will give orders concerning you. Meaning, he's giving her the diplomatic brush off. Let's just solve this privately without all the paparazzi and the news reporters around, with all the press, and, and we'll, we'll do it there. But just go away right now. No, she wasn't willing to take that for an answer. She was desperate. And she said to the king, The blame is on me, my lord the king, and on my father's house. But the king and his throne are clean. What did she mean? What did she mean that there was blame that she and her father's house would take? that would otherwise be on the king and his throne. Had David somehow been involved in the murder? No. What kind of blame? Blame for forgiving a truly guilty murderer. Judicial responsibility. Responsibility as a judge. How do you feel about somebody who is a judge and they let someone guilty off the hook? Right? How do you feel about that? There was a judge back in California years ago when I was a student at Berkeley, and people got really angry with the judge because he kept letting a rapist go when the rapist had raped multiple women, and the judge kept letting him go. It's unfair, but it's also irresponsible. It's dangerous to society. And so this is something that should not happen. But the woman said, O oh, king, you don't have to worry about it. Your throne representing your authority, your reputation, will not have to bear this kind of judicial responsibility. I and my father's house will bear it. And so David said, okay, that's fine. I forgive the young man. I protect him. And the woman asked for him to swear with an oath. And he did and protected that, that young man. Now, the woman's story was a made-up story put in her mouth by Joab who was trying to rearrange the king's thinking towards his own son, Absalom, who had gone into exile for murdering his half-brother, Amnon, after Amnon had raped Absalom's sister, Tamar. So it's a very complicated plot. But the point is that David reacted according to real principles of justice and mercy. What do we find out about God? Why do we find that God needs to forgive sins and then to have something else that's beyond that as a stage of atonement, beyond sacrifice? Why would forgivable sins be handled twice at the sanctuary? After forgiveness, what need for atonement could remain? This story gives us the answer. God is like David, morally responsible for his judgments including forgiveness of guilty people, having paid our ransom. God is just when he justifies those who fa have faith in Jesus. God balances justice and mercy, the two sides of love. He does this perfectly, but God has a challenge. He solves this challenge through a judgment. Now, this judgment involves his sanctuary. This judgment is between the loyal and the disloyal. And we see this in Daniel chapter 7, that there's a great judgment. The books are open in front of the Ancient of Days, who is God. We see in Daniel chapter 8 that this justifying or cleansing of God's sanctuary is fulfilling the same role. It's in response to the same set of problems. So that raises the question, how could we have a, 
a justifying or a cleansing of God's heavenly sanctuary through a judgment. How could that work? Notice that there's a big connection with the Day of Atonement. Because on the Day of Atonement, people were judged according to their loyalty or disloyalty when the sanctuary was cleansed. In Leviticus 23, verses 29 and 30, a person that doesn't show loyalty to God by practicing self-denial, that is, humbling oneself by fasting and other kinds of things, that person would be cut off. The person who didn't keep Sabbath on that day to show loyalty to God would be destroyed. So on that day, you had to show loyalty and pledge allegiance to Him. There was a judgment on the ancient Day of Atonement. And in Daniel chapter 7 and 8, you have a judgment that, like the Day of Atonement, involves a cleansing of the sanctuary. Why? What's going on? What's the connection here? There are other connections between Leviticus 16, about the Day of Atonement, and Daniel 7 and 8. In Daniel 7, 13, Christ moves towards the Ancient of Days, which is the Father, just as the earthly Israelite high priest moves towards the presence of God on the Day of Atonement. Furthermore, the expression cleansing or being, being pure, that Hebrew term in Leviticus 16, and the term in Daniel 8, 14, being just or righteous, both of these terms are synonyms referring to legal cleansing or justification. We can see that in Job 4.17, both terms are used as synonyms. Leviticus 16, pure. Daniel 8.14, righteous. Both ways to refer to legal vindication, showing that somebody is right. How could the judgment justify God's sanctuary? Vindicate God? In what sense? We've already seen God's throne represents His justice. God's justice must be vindicated because he forgives guilty people. David forgave that guilty young man in that story. But he had to bear a cost of judicial responsibility. When it came to his son Absalom, when he forgave Absalom, there was nobody to bear that responsibility for him. The woman of Tekoa didn't do that when it came to his own son. When God forgives us, he bears a cost of mercy. Judicial responsibility for forgiving, for extending mercy, when in fact we have been guilty. Let me ask you this. Have any of you out there in front of this screen ever committed an act of sin? Of course, I'll raise my hand. Yes, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, I'd like to ask you a second question. How many of you have ever been forgiven by God? You truly believe that you're being forgiven through the sacrifice of Christ. I raise my hand again. Yes. That means that God has truly forgiven truly guilty people. Is a judge supposed to do that? No. A judge is supposed to vindicate the innocent and condemn the guilty. Deuteronomy 25 verse 1. 1 Kings 8 verse 32. That's what a judge is supposed to do. A judge is not supposed to be in the business of forgiving people, letting guilty people off the hook. So when God does that, he must also be vindicated when he forgives people. He must be vindicated as well when he condemns rebels. He's got to show what kind of people these are. Are they loyal or are they disloyal? If these people are rebellious, then they defile his sanctuary by defaming him, by claiming to be God's people when in fact they're rebellious against him. They affect his reputation, his character, as it is shown in the world. Not his character in actuality, but as it comes across to other people. So God must be vindicated, and this is how he does it, is through this judgment pointed forward to by the rituals of the Day of Atonement when his sanctuary, representing his character, authority, reputation, justice, is cleansed. God's reputation matters. By forgiving guilty people, God lays himself open to a charge of injustice. He disturbs the balance of mercy and justice in the universe. But in Christ, God took the responsibility for forgiving guilty but repentant people. He can do that because he's paid the price once and for all for our sin. That's why he has the right to forgive us if we are repentant. God is vindicated when he justifies those who believe, those who have faith, but Satan continues to accuse, Revelation 12, verse 10. He doesn't even punch out at 5. 
He is accusing the brethren and the sisters, I would add, day and night by saying that people do not really have faith because only those with faith can be saved. And Satan knows as well as anybody, and better than most, he knows that by grace you are saved through faith, according to Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. But he also knows, according to James 2, 26, faith without works is dead. So if you don't have true faith, living faith, that works through love, Galatians 5, verse 6, then that faith is really not in operation, and therefore you can't grasp hold of grace. The salvation equation of grace plus faith equals salvation is broken, and therefore, he says, you're mine. It reminds me of a story, um, not just a story, but uh, it's something that, that happened back in California. I was working for a man building his house, doing construction, and he was a man who was a mortician. He embalmed dead people. And he told me that he worked for a, um, a man who owned a, a funeral home. And this mortician who owned this funeral home used to sign his letters, not yours truly, but eventually mine. Eventually mine. That's macabre, isn't it? But that's what Satan says. He says, you're eventually mine because... You don't have faith because you have sinned, and I know how you've sinned. And that proves that your faith is dead, and therefore you don't have salvation. God is not fully justified until an end-time judgment because he can't save a person who does not have, in the present tense, faith. Colossians 1, 21 to 23. You've got to have faith, and you've got to go on having faith without giving it up, without throwing away this trillion-dollar check of salvation. You've got to have faith. If you had it in the past and gave it up, it's no good. You've got to have faith and keep on having it. The question then in the judgment is, who has, in the present tense, who has faith in Jesus? The question in the judgment is not, who has sinned? We'll talk about that more in the next presentation. It's not who has sinned, but who has faith in Jesus. Now, in the judgment, why does it work the way it does? Because only God can read thoughts. When I pray to God, and it's in my mind, there's a place of quiet rest, of security, and of privacy between these two ears, and Satan is not able to hack his way in. Now, he may be able to read my, my thoughts in the sense that we can read each other's from my eyes if they dilate or if I start to sweat or my behavior, my body language, but he cannot actually read my thoughts. Jesus could read thoughts, and that's why he could answer the thoughts of Simon before Simon even spoke, and that proved that Jesus was divine. Only God can read thoughts. Now, because the judgment consists of records of works that show whether true faith exists, you see, that correlates with the fact that only God can read thoughts. If it were just our thoughts of faith that came up in the judgment, that would be because the judgment is for God's benefit. But the judgment isn't for God's benefit. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows everything. The judgment is for the benefit of his created be beings. And you can see that in Daniel 7, verses 9 and following, you have a whole jury there, as the books are open, of God's created beings, angels and so on, who are witnessing what happens. They can't read thoughts of faith. Only God can do that, and the judgment isn't for his benefit. So that's why God uses records of works in order to show evidence for faith or lack of faith. That's why it's a judgment of works, according to Ecclesiastes 12, 14, where everything that we've done, every secret thing, comes into judgment. Why are we judged by our works? Is it because we're saved by our works? No. We're saved by grace through faith. But you cannot separate works of, of faith from the faith itself. You can't separate it. When God said to Abraham, Lech Lecha, get going, Genesis 12, and I'll take you to a land that I will show you, make of you a great nation. And Abraham says to Sarah, come on, honey, we've got to get packing. Let's load up those donkeys and all the animals. And, and they start packing. I want to ask you the question, was that faith or was that works? Who'll say it was faith? What about who'll say it's works? Well, it's both, isn't it? because you can't separate faith from works. Not if they're true 
works of faith. The judgment reaffirms assurance of those who are forgiven. Daniel 7, 22. In the judgment, God considers records of these works to demonstrate the trend of this person's life in accepting His grace. As we talked about with Mary, the mother of Jesus, the question is, are you saying yes to God? Are you saying, yes, Holy Spirit, through Christ, come come and fill me? Because of Christ's sacrifice, the gift of the Holy Spirit can, can bring the presence of Christ into our lives. And we can be changed if we accept that gift. If that's the case, then I can say, 1 John 5, verse 12, He that has the Son has life. It's just that simple. Assurance of salvation means having the Son. And that is having life. We have nothing to fear in the judgment. The judgment is for our benefit because it vindicates God in forgiving us and therefore vindicates the forgiveness that we have received, showing that we are not condemned, but we are forgiven. That's what the judgment does for people who believe in Christ. That is a wonderful thing. Having faith and receiving forgiveness means receiving Christ and the transformation that he brings to our lives through the Holy Spirit. Romans 8 is all about that transformation that comes with the gift of justification. He transforms us along with forgiving us. I love this statement by one of my favorite authors here. God's forgiveness is not merely a judicial act by which he sets us free from condemnation. It is not only forgiveness for sin, but reclaiming from sin. It is the outflow of redeeming love that transforms the heart. David had the true conception of forgiveness when he prayed, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. That's Psalm 51, verse 10. This is from Ellen G. White, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. And that is absolutely biblically true. I've investigated this concept from all different angles from the Old Testament, from the New Testament, and it is absolutely true. God's forgiveness doesn't just leave us the way we were. He changes us and gives us a new life. When Jesus Christ forgave the woman who was caught in adultery, he didn't just say to her that uh, your sins are forgiven. He didn't just say, neither do I condemn you. He said, go and sin no more. You have the empowerment to live a new life. When God healed Naaman, didn't just take away his yucky, awful, leprous skin. He gave him new skin in its place. He transformed him at that time. Now we can look forward to God's judgment and deliverance. Unlike the woman of Tekoa, we don't have to bear responsibility for pardon because the deliverance that he gives is free. I love Isaiah 55 verses 1 and following. Here it says, Ho, everyone who thirsts. Now, if you were a California teenager, you wouldn't say ho. You'd say yo, yo, to get your attention. Come, everybody. And when I was a student at the University of California, Berkeley, I would then stroll down Telegraph Avenue. And on Telegraph Avenue, I would meet homeless people. And these were people who were sometimes pretty pitiful. They were eating out of garbage cans and their brains were fried with, by drugs and they hadn't combed their hair, it looked like, since 1968 in some cases. And they would sit there and look up at you with this face of, of, of longing and, and need and they would say, Hey man, do you got to die? And, and, and you would you'd pull something out to give to them. But, but now what about this language in Isaiah? Isaiah says, Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come buy and eat. Everyone who's hungry and thirsty, come buy and eat. What a heartless thing to say. You say to all these homeless, miserable people, everyone who's in need, how many of them? Well, that's everybody, all right? Come and buy. Well, they don't have any money. That's why they're sitting out there. What a heartless thing to say. Ah, but, the, but Isaiah goes on to say, in the next verses, he says, you who have no money, come buy and eat. What sense does that make? Why would he say, come if you have no money and buy and eat? Because he's saying there's a transaction that you can enter into. You can come and receive. You can buy, but the price is free to you. 
What a wonderful thing. It's infinitely valuable, this gift of salvation, of forgiveness, of transformation. And you can come along and you can accept. You can say, I want that right there. God, you're displaying it to me in your window. I want that gift above everything else. More than a pearl of great price, I want that gift of Jesus Christ in my life, making a difference now and for all eternity so that I can have eternal life. That gift can be mine and that can be free. But that doesn't mean that it was free to God because God paid an infinite sacrifice of His Son. It's a blood-drenched gift bought with awesome agony of separation of holy God from holy God separated by our sins on the cross. That is what buys the gift that is free to us. That is mercy with justice, full mercy, full justice. We don't have to have a woman of Tekoa because we have Christ to bear for us the cost of mercy. And I just love Psalm 85, verse 10. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. It's right there at the throne of grace, at the throne of God, where his law of love is inside the Ark of the Covenant, his law proclaiming love for God and love for man, that law which we have broken. And when Christ's blood is sprinkled on and before that law, meeting that need, paying that debt, this is the way for mercy and justice to meet each other and kiss each other. In this way, God completely preserves His law of love. God is love. Not partly love, not 25%, not 70 not 99.9999%. God is 100% love. And he's demonstrated this through the way he forgives us, this long, excruciating, difficult process. He does it the hard way because he wants to do it right. He wants to put us all back together when we've been broken so that we can be reconciled to him. That's why there are two phases. That's why there's atonement beyond forgiveness to not only forgive us and take away that evil from us, but to vindicate him in doing so, so that there will be no question as to his justice when he gives mercy. That concludes part three of our series called Altar Call. The part four, which is coming up, is called Who's Afraid of the Judgment? I think you'll find that really quite fascinating and we'll answer more of your questions about the sanctuary, because that's what we're studying, how the sanctuary and especially Christ's ministry there in his heavenly temple is teaching us about how we are saved.